welcome to Stop Now, a social experiment enter enterprise where we stop, listen, and share. I'm one of your hosts today, Walter, and with uh, JK and Amar, and today we are with uh, Tanya Gould, and could you introduce, introduce yourself to our audience really quick? Yes. Hi, I'm Tanya Gould. Um, so I'm a survivor leader for the anti-human trafficking um, movement, and I currently serve also my state as a director of anti-human trafficking for the Commonwealth of Virginia Attorney General's Office. And um, I serve on a plethora of organizations and agencies as a board member uh, or advisory uh, person. Okay. And yeah, well, I think, yeah, so you work for the office of the Attorney General of Virginia. So could you go into a little bit of detail of how uh, the Virginia's Attorney General's Office is looking to fight human trafficking, whether that's labor trafficking, sex trafficking, and, and some of the initiatives they have put forth? Um, well, absolutely. absolutely. Um, just very briefly, the Office of the Attorney General um, has obviously taken this matter of human trafficking seriously by hiring a survivor and a survivor leader. And it's just um, awesome to be able to work to ensure that our state, our Commonwealth, is working together um, and learning together, right, best practices in order to have a trauma-informed and survivor-centered response to human trafficking, building our capacity, um, and doing a ton of training. Um, and so working together to build our legislation in a way that totally supports survivors. And, um, and so we, are, we just had year one and have done a great job with bringing everyone together uh, in our Commonwealth. And what, do, what does that look like? Are, are there's their education efforts going forward or is it more on the law enforcement prosecutorial side of things? All sides. So in every, every uh, space that, um, or in every profession that a, a victim survivor would actually experience, you know, uh, firsthand from direct services, whether it be um, wraparound services or uh, the court system, the investigative prosecutorial piece, we are looking at all sides of the continuum of care uh, to ensure that, you know, we want those who identify as being trafficked. We want them to have the best support as possible because it's difficult to go through, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm being identified as someone who's trafficked and do I want to go through the court process? And if I do, what does that look like? So we are working together with, with a ton of organizations to make sure our Commonwealth attorneys, um, law enforcement, our Virginia State Police, um, we are working with them. They've started a human trafficking unit. We have also uh, we will be launching a state tip number for tips only, um, but we still refer folks to the National Survivor, I mean, to the National Human Trafficking Hotline for services. And so working together, you know, with all of our resources, because, you know, we can't do it by ourselves, right? So we understand that. Um, and just really utilizing the resources and paying attention to our gaps and creating a toolkit. We'll be creating a toolkit here soon um, because we've identified, uh, identified some gaps. Working on language, you know, all of those things that are, in my opinion, very foundational for state to kind of look at to see where we are. Like, how are you going to measure um, your data if you're not reaching folks properly, right? Um, what is your system for that? So those are the questions we are asking ourselves and then we're pulling our resources to get those types of answers. And looking at the data, um, what does it show for trafficking inside the state of Virginia? Is it a widespread problem? Is it a, a less of a problem than you thought? Or what are you, what is the data showing on that? So, like I said, that data is something that we're working on because we want to have a correct data as much as possible, right? Um, but going out into the community, talking to law enforcement, talking to, you know, folks in the trenches, those who are working the nonprofits, understanding trafficking and what it looks like in all areas of the state, because it looks different, right? When you look at Northern Virginia, you're looking at 
the intersection between gangs and um, trafficking, right? Or in Northern Virginia, you also have a lot of gaming um, initiated trafficking, right? Or exploitation. And so um, because of the widespread area, when you go Northern Virginia towards the West, right? Um, you find, especially in that area, unaccompanied minors, un un unaccompanied and undocumented minors. So it looks different there. And when you come down to, you know, say the southeastern part where it's very tourist, touristy, you know, we, we have um, uh, a different type of trafficking uh, ex exploitation in that area. You have a large military um, presence in that area. So it looks different there. Then when you move over to the southwestern part of the Commonwealth, you're going to find a lot of truck stops, right? So a lot of massage parlors, right? So you're going to find uh, things working differently out there. And I personally think it's important before you set legislation, right? Before you come out with a response, you need to get into the trenches and figure out uh, what traffickers already know about your state and, you know, work upstream from there. And, oh, and I'm, I'm assuming there's a, a good amount of benefit that comes from working with um, interstate jurisdiction or, or interstate law enforcement. So how does this, how what are some of the challenges when it comes to jurisdiction limits in, in that case? Um, does it help to work with um, other other jurisdictions to make sure you find those who are doing bad? Yeah, so that's the that's the beauty of task forces in your MDTs. That's the beauty of working with federal, state, and local, because those boundary issues are not a problem. Um, and so we currently have, you know, a task force. We have regional task force. We have some coalitions around the state. Um, and so we are able to work together really well with our resources. Okay. And, and what, because um, you, you did mention that you are a survivor and um, was that specifically what made you want to go into working um, against human trafficking? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say that um, I remember what it looked like. And I, I, I'll never forget um, what it feels like, what it what what I saw when I was with buyers or when I was in a community where people were questioning whether I was prostituting or whatever I was doing, the looks on people's faces, um, or when I came out of my situation and tried to connect with services, right? You, you can, as a survivor, I felt a lot of shame. Um, my self-worth was under attack, right? Or just, there was a lot of things outside in the world that affirmed the negative feelings I had while being trafficked. And, you know, once I started on a healing track, I felt like, you know, it's possible to heal. Like it's possible to not be what I saw on people's faces or I felt from people who looked at me in a certain way. And when I found that path to healing, I knew that kind of like what you heard about Harriet Tubman, right? Like she found a way to freedom. And so, you know, do you really feel free when you know others may not know the way to freedom or the path to freedom? And that that's how I felt. I felt like, you know, I need other people like me who's been in a situation similar to mine to know that you don't have to stay this way, right? You don't have to, because, because you know, I, I ultimately felt like, why should I carry the burden or anything that my, my trafficker or those who hurt me and abuse me, why should I carry what they projected onto me why should I carry it like it's not my burden or why should I feel ashamed about it the shame came from the way society views this um this type of thing the myths you know they believe uh, all of that so when I fully understood that and saw and saw my path as a way to freedom um I decided to jump in and along with other survivor leaders 
and continue to create a way towards wholeness and healing and life after being in something so horrific. <clears throat> what are some of the things that you think society can do to not shame people in, who have gone through situations like that? Um, one of my favorite things to say to address this is that number one, we have this problem because of the demand and we need to acknowledge that it's unhealthy. We need to acknowledge the fact that we have um, we have supported the saying that goes, boys will be boys, right? We've supported that as a society and made it okay for generations. So acknowledging that that's wrong and we shouldn't have that mentality and work on ways to change that mindset, that way of thinking um, is important. Uh, because th those are the those are the the ideas or the things that strengthen the, the the demand, right? And so when you have people like myself, you know, when I go to trainings and I just bring awareness to communities, there's a lot there's a lot of this type of mindset that myself as a survivor have to break down and bring this truth. Um, I shouldn't be the only one doing that. Or we as survivors shouldn't be the only ones doing that. We should be uh, lifted and highlighted in that way. And this is something that, you know, we fight for a lot of things. This is something that um, has been going on generationally and we need to really address it, but do it in a healthy way, right? And so a lot of times you find, you know, people try to, instead of deal with the issue, they try to empower the issue and says, well, you know, well, let's, let's, talk about prostitution. Why don't we just let this happen? You know, and, uh, and, and my thought is, um, you know, first of all, I don't want to remain a marginalized community being a, a black, a black and brown person, right? I don't want to continue to, you know, I want to have opportunities outside of something I've been exploited by. Right. And, um, and so, so, you know, we need to like really look at, how we're approaching issues and make sure we deal with root causes versus, you know, perpetuating it or, um, or, you know, just doing things that, that doesn't really deal with uh, the root cause. Uh, wouldn't you agree that there is a, a big difference between someone consenting to do something and someone being forced, manipulated, and coerced into doing something? Well, yeah, because the definition of human trafficking is forced fraud and coercion. So any time, you know, when for a lot of, um, for, for not for everyone, but there are folks like me who are survivors who was brought into this, you know, through coercion. So my boyfriend who ended up being my pimp, he knew there at, at for, he knew from the beginning that this was what he was going to do with me. Right. So he had to gain my trust and, and respect and, you know, love and acceptance in order to bring this on me. So, you know, um, so understanding this now, you know, it's just just think about it. If he would have came to me with his, his original idea and was just honest and said, this is what I want to do, then I would have been informed. And that's con that's consensual. Right. Because I consented with an idea that he had based on where he how he groomed me. Right. So that consent was coerced. It wasn't what he said. It wasn't what I thought. And, and neither was the entire relationship. And I think you're making a, a great a point when you, you're saying survivors. Could you define what the difference between a victim and survivor is to you? Absolutely. So for me. Um, a couple things. It was important for me to understand that I was a victim because, because for so long I thought I was a criminal. So to to really like begin to admit that I was a victim of something meant that I could let go of the the spaces where I felt like I was to blame, right, or that it was my fault. Or, or it, it, it was accepting that he tricked me, he coerced me. This was a crime done to me. So, for
for me, acknowledging that I was the victim is acknowledging all of that. The path from victimhood, the victim mindset, the victim response, you know, which is a thing, right? This is, this is real. So for me, acknowledging that and, and then looking for a pathway to survivorship was a process because I had to heal from all the things that I was a victim of, right? All the, the things he exploited, all the coercion, the, psych, the psychological piece of it, the emotional piece of it, the physical piece of it, all of that is, is, is acknowledging that the entire part of me, the entire part of me, like my whole self was affected by a crime that was done to me. And so moving to survivorship um, was, it, I mean, that was hard. <laughs> it was a challenging path. And it was something that I could be hopeful for and look forward to, right? It's something that inspired and encouraged me that I didn't have to stay a victim, but I could now, you know, move to survivorship. And it, there's no fine line or a big line to say, well, now I'm a survivor and I'm no longer a victim. Victim was a part of my story. And I know I could, I could just say that based on, you know, myself. The other thing for me is when I've done some work overseas and I learned that, you know, some um, regions of the world in their language, they don't even have a word for that progress the progress from victim to survivor. So they don't have the word survivor, which is interesting to me. So when you say to them, you know, you, you should work with survivor leaders, they're thinking that doesn't make sense. Like this is a victim, you know? And um, so I think it's a word that you can use to help um, people in other regions, like especially legislators, um, people who work in the medical field, uh, law enforcement and other regions as well to understand that that person can grow and actually become a productive member and contribute to society in a healthy way. Um, that's, that's awesome. It's just like if someone um, was diagnosed with cancer and, you know, they accept, you know, I have cancer in my body. Now I have to fight because I no longer want this. And that is why we call them a survivor because they've acknowledged, they've moved past it and they went through this progress of, of no longer being in that situation. And so, um, so that's how I see it. And uh, could you detail some of the current projects you're working on to help combat uh, human trafficking and, and, and definitely some of the things that are within labor trafficking as well, since that seems to be an under part of, of the human trafficking. Um, um, battle across the globe? Yeah. Um, well, start, I mean, on the starting, you know, in my state, we do have instances of labor trafficking and uh, have worked with the federal government to, you know, on those cases. We are still learning more about trafficking as a whole, but for us in Virginia, um, still being able to say that, you know, we can identify this well, that's not where we are yet. Um, but we are getting there. Um, and so, and that's with training, making sure that labor trafficking issues are um, are talked about in awareness and training, right? And the identification and the process um, and the support that uh, labor trafficked uh, folks, uh, those who are having that experience can get. And so we do have, um, we do have a few victim services, um, homes or shelters or placement for those who are labor trafficked as well. Um, is, it, mm -hmm. uh, is, it, is it more difficult to find labor trafficking because it's more uh, at some levels, there's big corporations are taking advantage of individuals. So how, how does a state go about finding labor trafficking and identifying it because it, there might be legal gray areas that that companies might be exploiting certain laws and taking advantage of uh, people who might not come forward to the place because of an immigration status or other reasons. So, what? How? How do you go about identifying those people being exploited in a labor context? Yeah, it is really difficult. My advice would be to rely heavily on what the federal government is doing because they know 
um, how to identify better than a lot of states do because they've worked on it on an international level and understand all the networks that are involved. Well, not all of them, but many of the networks that are involved. And so that's what we're doing, you know, working with the federal government to understand it ourselves. Um, so as far as how hard it is to identify, it's only because we haven't practiced it. We haven't practiced identifying labor trafficking specifically. And so it's just the same with um, sex trafficking is, is that, okay, we're coming more and more familiar with what that could look like because we have prostitution, right? So that's how we can help people begin to identify and work through that in their minds. So now we have to say, okay, uh, you know, sometimes when you're seeing, you know, construction sites and you see people who, you know, may not be citizens of, you know, our country or you go into massage parlors and, you know, uh, they they may or may not be. Right. So, you know, when you see this, we have to give people in the community something to to that's familiar to them to say, okay, you see these things, let's just start there. We're not seeing everyone in that situation is being trafficked, but we wanna give you an idea of what this could look like. And that is very helpful when we're doing our awareness. Um, we point out those things um, for yeah. folks to, to, to try to look out for. Uh, and that's just on a really you know small level in community because that's how it kind of happens, right? Most of the time it's a community member that sees something and says something, uh, which we, we need that. We need community to be more aware of what's going on in their surroundings. It's so easy to get caught up on uh, things on the internet because that's the world we live in. Um, but like, even when we're talking about um, trafficking is happening more online, right? Well, yeah, the connection has happened online, but you need some place, you know, in, in, around you in the physical world um, to manifest this. And so we need people to be more aware about what's going on in your community, you know, lawn service, um, companies, um, construction companies, agriculture, like we need people to, to, to think about it. You know, um, I, if, if a person sees a bus load, like bus loads of folks coming in and they're not sure, you know, what they're doing, but you know, their bus loads coming into a, a agricultural area, you know, that that could be something concerning. And for me as a citizen and someone who was trafficked, I'm OK with you making that tip and just calling and saying, I, you know, see something I, I, I'm not sure. Can someone go check it out? For me, I'm OK with that, you know, because until we like really start getting into this and making people aware and empowering people to make these types of calls, we're not really going to find out how this is happening in our in our states you know, in our country really well. Is there, is there a, a area where it comes in like you're, we're stigmatizing certain labor forces. If people call in and say, we think these people are being trafficked and they're doing that work consistently, there's no issue. Is that? And yeah. I think people will do that. I do. I, I mean, um, but I can't control the outcomes. Right. Um, you know, when I do trainings or awareness trainings, in communities, I I want to empower people to call. People do call, and with you know, and stigmatize a situation and and think it's one thing and it's not, you know. But then there are calls that are made that are what it is, and I think as a community member, um, I I I would like to see us become more involved about what's going on around us, and um, because the traffickers, they have a network. They know their networks and they work them well, right? They get along in a way that they know they need to keep their business running and they do what they have to do. So yeah. that for, for us as, you know, citizens, as people who are trying to just live a life free from exploitation and, you know, having a safe place for our kids to go and I have to be so concerned and worried, you should be concerned and worried, right? Because a lot of us are so busy, we're not paying attention to this. We need to pay more attention. And so we need to know our neighbors. We need to know what's going on around our schools. We need to know who's doing what, right? We need, we, we just, we need to be more involved. And so traffickers know when communities are more involved. They're not going to go where they feel like they're going to be spotted or there's going to be a problem. 
right? They're not going to go into those communities. They're going to be extra careful and it's not worth it because there are too many other communities they can move around. And what are some of the, the big global initiatives right now that are directed at combating um, human trafficking and some of the projects that you're currently working on? Some global initiatives? Um, I know one thing in particular that I can speak to um, is really highlighting survivor leaders in as many regions as possible around the world because, um, you know, it makes a difference when you bring survivors into whether it's legislation or programming, uh, we need to bring survivor leaders into the, you know, conception of an idea or a conception of a project um, and, and, and all the way through implementation. Um, that's key. So if we can do that on all, on all of our, you know, whether it's international or global advisory councils down to, um, you know, victim services, right, in the trench work, mentorship right? Holding hands with victims and survivors. Um, that's where survivors are needed in every space. And it's opportunity for that because, you know, there are organizations that are happening now that, you know, if they chose to bring in a survivor leader to help them with, they, with their work, our work together would be so much more meaningful, you know? Um, so that, so that's why we're promoting for an example, like advisory councils um, to happen all over the world. We need to be able to see them, begin to see them more. Like, you know, when I said earlier that um, the word survivor and talking to, um, you know, leaders around the world, you know, about the word survivor and how empowering that is, you know, and then if you as a country or region acknowledge that there's a path from victimhood to survivorship, Right. And then you want to empower the survivorship. You know, why wouldn't survivors be ready or victims be ready to come into survivorship? Because there's just space for us. Right. You're not looking at us how, you know, we feel like um, or we know people look at us. Right. And so that's adding value, especially on a top level, you know, on a federal state or whatever, on a government level with authority. So that's the authority of the state or this the, the authority of the country saying, we acknowledge that you, you know, were in this space. Here you are working on, you know, um, on, you know, building value in your life. And we support that. We want you to build value in your life. We don't want you to stay a victim forever. You know, that that we don't believe your situation is hopeless. We believe that you can actually be whoever you want it to be, whatever that is. It doesn't have to be a, a survivor leader in government. It could be a survivor leader. You could become a doctor. You could do anything you want to do. Your life isn't lost because someone made you a victim. And is, a, is that a hard step for um, victims to come to because of the way that some people may look at them in society? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, if, you know, when you think about, just, you know, just, just think about this and think about my, my story, my life. Right. And I'm telling you that, you know, having to be coerced, manipulated, forced, threatened to live this way every day, right. Does something to your personhood, right. It does something to your value to your self-esteem, you feel like nothing. And I, I like to tell people, the only thing I could compare this to what it could feel like is the dirt be be beneath someone's shoe. That that's, that's the only thing that I could think of. Like, I've been in that place. I know what it feels like to be, to feel and to be looked upon as this, like dirt under someone's shoe. So to rise up above that, and to dream again, like, cause, cause that kind of dirt on, under someone's shoe is that's at the mercy of whatever, right? There's no, it's not like sand at the beach. There's a purpose for that in a way, right? You kind of, maybe you want to take this a little deeper, right? But when you feel like dirt under someone's shoe, you just feel like you're so hopeless and there's nothing for you. And you don't even dream because you've lost power over your life. And so to regain power, that means you have had to like grow. You've had to say, I'm going to 
get to know who I am. I'm going to build my self-esteem and I'm going to do this. And that's why we need service providers and people who want to see survive, who want to see people in the situation when they were victimized to see them as survivors. And so, you know, I appreciate organizations and I say to them all the time, what, this is what I need. I need you when you're working with someone who's identified as being trafficked, whether it's labor or sex. I need you to build your program around seeing them as the best person they think they could ever be. Don't build your program around, you know, th their victimization, but build it around hope and their survivorship. Like that's the journey. That's the support, you know, empower them. You know, that's how you should be building your program. Are we getting better as a society at doing that? Or do you think there's still a long way to go in that regard? I'm, I mean, we are getting better. Um, you, We have to keep the momentum, right? So in my opinion, you know, I'm not sure when we're talking about how better we are. I can't say that we're, 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 we're better. If, survivor leaders weren't pushing so hard i don't believe we'd be where we are and you know and uh do you think the, the legal system needs to do more or to rehabilitate people doing these kind of crimes or what do you think needs to be done to try to you know stop stop this stop individuals who want to traffic people before it ever happens. Like what can we do to be more proactive than reactive to stop the, because if you're wanting to traffic someone there, there's definitely something wrong with you as an individual to, to treat someone. In exactly. Way. No, <laughs> like that was real talk. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we need to be, we need to have harsher penalties everywhere on buying sex. I, I think it should be easy to buy sex. Um, it's illegal most places, most in the United States, it's illegal to buy sex. And the penalties aren't harsh enough. Um, I think the penalties should, because now, like I said earlier, as a government, um, it, you know, especially state and, <clears throat> and, and localities, when you're harsher on buyers, you're saying, we believe that uh, you know, vulnerable people deserve more, right? We're looking at the health of our citizens. Um, we have to, it, like I said, we just, it's just acknowledging that having such a, a crazy amount of demand for sex, um, we have to acknowledge that it, it is unhealthy. I, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I don't, it, it's unhealthy. You know, it's unhealthy when, you know, uh, I also done some mentorship with our children's hospital and you know the amount of kids that are sexually abused the amount of kids that are trafficked is alarming that's unhealthy and so you know we have to do a better job with the buyer's side um, yeah. to show the support for just the value of human dignity well, there, um, I think there's there's been studies that kind of look into to that 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 might not keep people as safe. But when we're talking about consent and things like that, I mean, consent, consensual activity, uh, that is healthy because you're getting consent. But we're talking about people that are first and forced in the situation. So, uh, or people are seeking a consent with this transaction and other people who want to force people into it. I mean, that, those are two entirely different categories. So how, like, how do we keep people who, who want to hurt individuals and not those who want to seek consensual activity? Because if we, we look at relationships, everything is transactional in a way, whether it's sexual or friendship or not, there's always going to be some sort of transaction going on because that is human nature. But how do we keep those who want to hurt people from hurting people and not, and not, and not going after people seeking consent in whatever form that is? I mean, well, two things come to mind. First, I mean, if we had harsher pen penalties on people who hurt people sexually, um, a lot of it, that goes back to the boys would be boys. People, predators get second chances way too often. 
And that's just our loss. So if the crime, if you do the crime, you should do what, what it is and make sure that it's harsh. Because when we have harsh penalties on things like this, this is a very serious issue because what's I feel like is not being understood is that, you know, this is how we keep populations vulnerable. When we continue to have um, this type of crime happening, it takes a person to, it, when, a, when a person is sexually abused, especially as children, a lot of kids are not believed eat right and then this continues in families that same child grows up to be an adult are, are they living their best life or, or are they still traumatized from what happened to them so we still have many different numbers one in 13 uh boys or one in 13 girls or it's it's still one of something it's too many so we have this um sexual abuse happening happening in our country so much you know with no real plan for or a plan that's enforced, then people are able to get away with it. So I firmly believe if we are if we are, are really serious about our future, you know, meaning the future of the planet, then we care for its people. And so as children, children are the are, in my opinion, the most vulnerable living organism on our planet because they're they're going to grow we're going to leave right so making sure that they're protected and have healthy lives that's our job that's us if we don't do that then who's going to do it so now you know you have a whole generation or two or three of people who felt like they had to take care of themselves because they didn't have uh, appropriate adult supervision and care or justice, right? And then they grow up as adults, still feeling in that way. And then they have kids. And then if you have trauma, how are you able to uh, have, have the capacity to really care for in a healthy way, your own children? And then the cycle continues. So again, it's, you know, understanding the issue, understanding it's unhealthy and we're breeding this. Right. If we're sitting in a room, we know at least one in five or one in 13 or one in three. There's a, there's, you know, so many different statistics, depending on so many different things are, uh, will be sexually abused. You know, uh, by the time they're 18, we need to take that seriously. The other issue is there's, you can, if you, you know, sexual activity, in my opinion, is sacred. That's between myself and the person that I'm consenting to have sex with. Okay. However that happens, but that's a sacred to me, that's a sacred part of life. Right. So when we're buying and selling, selling out of that sacredness, it pulls away from what we, when we're looking at value and worth of an individual. Isn't that an individual's, own, I mean, what, what someone's could be self-worth to one person wouldn't necessarily be the same kind of morality of another person. Oh, is that, I mean, so that's, isn't that on an individual by individual basis? So let me, I, so, so let me tell you where I get this from my own personal experience. Let me, let me break it down for you. So for me as a child, right. Being sexually abused, right. Um, having pornographic or having uh, uh, photos taken of me, right? Not knowing where they're going, not knowing what, what's going on with them, but being forced to do that, being trafficked, right? And then having my trafficker put a price on something that's sacred. Now, as a woman, you know, when you're having sex with multiple men, you know, and you're coerced or forced, or or maybe this is something like like, do you do you think that this is an enjoyable experience, right? So that that's a real question. Is this is this an enjoyable experience where I can get up and say, you know, I'm I'm happy with my life, you know. I love the life that I'm living, you know, having sex with this many men a day. I would say there are some people 
who may say yes i'm fine with it we're talking about like now, I mean, consensual activity like well consensual activity i'm talking about what whether I'm, I'm talking about the value we're talking about what people value but your question was around value and worth you know and and sex right, right. so so there right so that's a very small part of the population that is is actually doing this where where we don't want to we've been coerced and forced and you know or we were sexually abused as kids Right. And so now we feel a sense of empowerment that's unhealthy. Right. So there's something to whether we want to uh, believe it or not. Remember, we're talking about we need to go back to the root causes and stop just saying, oh, well, what if this is a no, we need to go back to the root causes of a lot of this stuff, you know, and we need to like heal those places that says, you know, um, consensual or not, are you in your right mind when you're consenting? Were you sexually abused as a child when you were consenting? Like, because you didn't consent then and maybe you don't understand what consent is, right? So there's like all these things we have to walk through as a society. I just think we need to be honest about that. I mean, how do we, on the on an individual level though, like because if an if an adult, um, whether they're whatever their gender is, and if they consent and, and do enjoy those activities, how do we, um, isn't are we walking a, a gray area telling them, there's something wrong with you doing that because not everyone's going to have the same um, sex drive or, or whatever, or the same moralistic standpoint on sexual activity or compared to people being forced and coerced into something. That's, I feel like those are two, no, two different. I, I, I think I, I'm, I'm just saying, I think these are things that we need to talk about and dress. And I love that you brought up about sex drive because people do need to manage their own sex drive. Like, I, I think, people need to understand just, you know, when you eat too much, you gain weight. Right. <laughs> right. So there are consequences to have doing too much, having too much. And I think that people should be able to responsibly manage their sex drive when it comes down to it. That is the answer <laughs> is managing it yourself and being respectful of someone else managing theirs and having that type of space. But when it comes to purchasing and buying into that, you know, space of self-management and you, you know, coming into someone else's life and, you know, and, and trying to purchase, you know, are you managing your sex drive? You know, I, I don't know. Right. Um, um, and then when you go into hurting someone, right, definitely not managing your sex drive, but sometimes you think it's okay if I hurt someone and I'm buying it, right. Then at some level inside of you, you think that's okay. Since I bought it, it's mine right? That's unhealthy, right? And I know that person's thinking, well, I bought this lamp and it's mine, but I'm a human being. You can't buy me like that. And you shouldn't feel like just because you bought this, it's yours for this moment because it's mine the whole time, right? right so yeah. it's- That, yeah, that that goes yeah, back into what you're saying, boys would be boys. I mean, there's, there's consent and respect levels even in all those kind of circumstances. And and yeah, that's the, that, that is where I, I, I think like, yeah, if Oh, no matter, no matter how what the transactional consent is, if that consent is there and is respectful, that that does feel a lot different than coercion and force. And that's a, that's a completely yeah. different mind yeah. mindset. Whether um, um, how are we how we get back there? I do think there needs to be for hurting people. Um, yeah, that's one thing. And consensual activity, uh, I think that's something that people, um, you know. If it's if it's consensual, I mean, in my my opinion is like we don't need to, uh, we don't need to get into people's personal lives and behind closed doors if everything is safe and healthy. I think so. Um, I'm, I'm being told that we are running out of time. Um, and uh, yeah, was there, was there anything that before we wrap up that you wanted to promote that you are working on, or where people could um, um, any organization that you think would be good to uh, look at in your in your work that you're currently working on? Um, no, I just, I really, um, and I, and we talked about this earlier, I really want, um, would like for people to, if you're going to have a human trafficking, anti-human trafficking organization committee or anything like that, if you're going to be writing legislation or, you know, um, doing anything that has anything to do with human trafficking, um, you need to have a survivor leader with you, um, in that journey that, that is, you know, imperative, especially, you know, like I said earlier, um, we 
it, it, there's a strong push. There's always been a strong push, but everyone wasn't willing, right? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate like the State Department um, tip office, really bringing in survivors and creating a way for organizations to look and say, see, working with survivors work. It, it, it This is something that works. Um, and so, you know, um, do I, I think the government can do more? Yeah. But I think that nonprofits and those that are in the trenches, they need to do more. They need to go ahead and, you know, trust working with survivors um, in order to, uh, you know, really see a difference and to change a mindset, right? Because if you don't see enough of us um, and you're, if you don't see enough of us or hear from enough of us, then you'll hear other voices. And I believe we as survivors, we are the ones that write history, right? We are the ones that tell our stories. And so I'd rather organizations work with us, hear our stories up close and personal than to hear our stories from someone else or, you know, someone who say they work with survivors or, you know, someone who think they know what survivors want because organizations do it all the time. They think they know what survivors want, um, but we know what we want. Like we, we have dreams, you know, before our abuse, before our exploitation, you know, we're people um, with dreams and ideas. And so, um, so yeah, so just really encouraging organizations, governments, um, local, all the way to federal to continue working with survivors and paying them well, just like you would any other consultant to come and make sure your organization is doing well. Um, we are experts in our field. And so um, getting us and getting our insight is just as valuable. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely keep that in mind. And uh, it was great speaking with you today. And I, I do uh, wish you well. Thank you so much. Thank you.